Thank you. This is this is. Uh... It's a lot of fun, although I, I must say, you know, talking from the funding side versus uh, I am I'm a kind of a big system builder by by trade. Now I'm 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 trying to build big companies that build big systems. Uh, so one level of indirection. Uh, but but actually a couple of bits about NEA is is important to frame the talk. Um, we are right next to Slack on Sand Hill Road, um, actually to first order the world's largest uh, venture uh, company. We have. Uh, 11 billion dollars under management and are halfway through a two and a half billion dollar fund. Those fun that fund will last around three years. Okay, so just to kind of set set your bid, the the expectation of, of an investor in that fund is like 3x. So you know how do you turn that two and a half billion into something eight to ten billion dollars? And um, if you you think about that calculus. Uh, you would think that, well, you've got, we have to have big outcomes. And that's right. And uh, the question is, how do you get those big outcomes? And the answer is somewhat surprising. And it's about the patterns that, we're, that we see and how we invest. And that's actually investing in very small efforts and small teams and, 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 and growing rapidly. Uh, and um, you know, that's a little bit maybe theoretical. Uh, from a practical side, I noticed that HP Vertica was sponsoring the, the morning that one of our, uh, was one of our portfolio companies. Um, and uh, so there's a whole other style of investment, which is uh, just follow Mike Stonebreaker around and invest in his companies. <laughs> You don't have to pay any attention to what I'm saying here. Um, so this this is uh, it's a it's a talk also that that's going to get into really about how the the amplifiers that are around now as small companies. If either you're doing something in software or you're doing something in hardware. Um, there is a, a special environment, and it has really changed over this period uh, of this last decade about sort of how you can have, um, take a small piece and actually amplify it into something large. Um, and at the core of this, uh, kind of surprising is the, the network itself. And I, um, I'm gonna spend sort of the first part of this talk sort of building that up, right? To, it's, it's, it's interesting, right, that the, the internet and the way we've seen it grown has has precipitated these really large, intense companies. We, we got a great sample from that, looking at, you know, through Jeff's eyes at, at Google. Um, so, you know, it looks like the network kind of wants to build these big things, but it, it it's also has this tremendous power to let you go pick little pieces, uh, get very good at those little pieces, and have them grow out. So just think about that um, as we go through this. So just, just very quickly, sort of from a, you know, a high bandwidth point of view, what has been happening to us over the last uh, couple of decades, um, and it's really web, I, I always like high energy physics because I, I love all the, you know, the, ultimately the, 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 the contribution of, of uh, the web there. But, but you know, we're, we're all familiar with sort of this exponential, the exponentials behind bandwidth growth. Um, and it's what, you know, uh, certainly what we all experience. What, what you have to multiply the bandwidth by, and this is both backbone and, and endpoint bandwidth, of course, are the devices that are demanding it, right? And it's that, it's that multiplication that, that creates the entire demand on the network. In fact, I think today is, uh, uh, is an Apple announcing iPhone N plus one. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, it's billions of devices times that endpoint bandwidth. And since we mostly today, and there are a lot of reasons behind it, that we mostly serve uh, not peer-to-peer, -peer, we serve off of a large-scale infrastructure serving out to those devices, there's a really simple bit of, of sort of Kirchhoff's law here that you know, the in has to equal the out. So if you have all this demand on, on the device end and they're mostly being served uh, uh, you know, uh, by the services on the left-hand side, then you have enormous scaling pressures on those things on the left. And how do you respond, right? And we, we saw Jeff show us how that, um, I, I, I had this rather, well, in 2006, a rather infamous blog on, you know, well, it's all gonna come down to just a few really big computers. And, um, 
and I, I think that's largely true. That that's what what's happened is, is that you know there are a few big O5 right um, kind of computers in the world, and and there you know there are hundreds of sort of specialized ones that are around that are big, um, but you know for special purposes, whether they're uh, you know national interests or they're. Uh, particular characteristics of, of, of the I.O. on those systems or security or something. Um, I should add to this that we d what doesn't get a lot of attention are these distribution networks, and I think they are becoming more and more important, and it was uh, really interesting seeing some of the, you know, the evolution and thinking around data in the Google network, because in, in a large part, it's the, you need to respond to latency and locality on a global scale, uh, enabling new sets of, of applications as well. So I, I pay more attention to that. Um, but what does happen is that that scale drives this, this brutal efficiency, right? It, it actually creates a cycle of opportunity of investment to uh, reduce the, the marginal cost of producing extra computing or storage. And, and why is that? It's because we built a marketplace and then that's the sense of which computing is a commodity. And it's not, the computers aren't a commodity. I, I guarantee you that's not, <laughs> right? A big data center uh, is, is, a, is high engineering art. Right? Just like all those other examples I had of commodities there that, uh, you know, whether you're talking about transportation or you're talking agriculture, the, the end product or energy may be the commodity, but the thing that, that goes and creates it, there's a lot of incentive in the systems to go uh, get very efficient at doing, at doing those things and we're well aware of it. Well, you, at, the, at the same time, so you may think, okay, so this world is really only about people who can go build big stuff. And, uh, and so how do I get that big so I can be efficient and do it? And, and, and actually what happens is that the existence of this world creates the opportunity for people to uh, go use this as an amplifier. And that's, that's the attitude. So if you, if you think about that today, say, well, I want to engage this stuff. I'm going to put my quarters into Amazon and, and, uh, and get back some computation. Um, you know, how do you build a service? Well, the, the old school was you bring your own stack, right? You find a bunch of bits, like I want to go do, say, some consumer service. So I, you know, I've, I get an OS and some various data stores that I need. And there are a bunch of services, whether it's identity management or communicating with your users or billing them or, you know, doing analytics on your site or whatever it is, that you would find out ways of doing that. You might write your code, you might stitch it together. But you don't do it that way now, right? What you, what you do is you say, look, I, I'm only going to focus on the core stuff because something like payments. Um, that's a lot of work. I've got to go certify my infrastructure to go do that, be compliant with various regulations around the world. So, you know, why don't I go find somebody who does that really well? All right, so there's somebody, Braintree does this service, card not present payments processing. You just stitch in the API call, right? And uh, voila, you've done two things, right? You've, you've gotten rid of that complexity in, in your stack, so you've, you've actually done less work and you've engaged uh, someone else. And of course, it's, it's like that's true for all of this stuff in, in um, uh, 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 the stack, increasingly so. What, what feels fixed, although I put a, you know, an ad in there for Box, not an ad, you know, I, 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 you'll see a lot of these logos, un, you know, shamelessly are portfolio companies, <laughs> right? So um, I'm only selecting them for, for those reasons. But, but, you know, for a large part, what happens is you, you reduce down to the, the, the stable point are these, um, you know, the, the storage that's in there or, you know, the, the data that these, that these services are organized around. But if you take any one of those, so if you look at Braintree as an example, it's actually a really large company now. And it specializes in doing that thing. And it started as a small effort of folks, right? We're going to go do the, the payment processing. And as it gets more and more successful, it grows to where actually its scale is quite interesting in its own right, right? And the sort of the design characteristics of what it does internally is, is interesting. And, and this is really a classic phase change. I've, I've just shown, you know, go, go to public, you know, listings of, of uh, APIs. And, you know, you're, we're now crossing over 
you know, well, you can you can see some of these numbers. You know, thirteen thousand as of March of this year at, at uh, API Hub. Um, you know, the the entire catalog for Unix and Linux applications was sort of uh, never got bigger than this, right? So we're, we've kind of changed over to where it's not programs that you're buying anymore; it's subscribing to these these APIs. So so why taking a step back of to what what is really happening? What's the um, this, this network connectivity is doing something special and it's worth taking a step back. And, and this, this observation um, is uh, uh, this effect, this kind of network entropy effect or something is, is an observation that I first heard from Rob, Rob Jingle who was a, a Sun Fellow. But when you, networks have this very powerful thing, when you hook a network up to a system and, and particularly sufficiently powerful networks, you, it, it, it sort of has, it has a force right? that, that causes that, those functions in that network to decompose, to be distributed and specialized and scaled. Right? So it's, it's, a, it's a little bit of an abstract notion, but you can kind of see this idea that the moving to this API world is really reliance on this better network connectivity. That better network connectivity enabled a piece to be pulled out, to go get distributed somewhere, to be specialized, and then to subsequently scale that specialized piece up. And now you have a contract with that specialized piece, and the people who are working on specialized piece get to, get to go do it. You know, just as a historical example in, in sort of the, the data-related area is, you know, computers before networks hooked up, right, you would have, remember, SCSI was a small <laughs> computer system interconnect. It was the local thing, right? And, and when you, very quickly in the 80s after, uh, you know, having some decent networks there, Things decomposed, right? We, we got file servers coming out, we pulled the disks out, we pushed the protocols across the networks, um, and, and we created these file servers. So why did that happen, actually? It's an interesting question. You know, because actually these file servers are just computers with a bunch of disks in them and blah, right? Well, there's, there's scaling advantage to doing that, right? That you get to be specialized and make really high quality file servers in doing this. You also get a network effect out of sharing that data, right? So they're, they're very powerful ways. And you have separate, you now have an innovation contract where the, the file system folks can go off and do their thing while other people do theirs. So this pattern actually is, is a key one, this, this uh, ability to distribute. So from a startup point of view, this is kind of magical. It's, 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 a, it's a really cool thing because you can go around, and this is the attitude that I, 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 I really urge in all of you, is that, you know, look at that smallest thing that you think you can go you know, do differently, add value to, or reimagine how that thing is done. And figure out how you pull that thing out. And if you're going after, you know, providing this as a service to other folks, you know, you, there are a bunch of things of low barriers to adoption of that. You make it fast and efficient. You keep scaling. You keep iterating. Because the other really essential thing that the network is doing is putting you in direct contact with the people who are, who are consuming it. It's, it's a lot like Jeff's principles of being within 50 feet of someone. You know, that it's, it's that feedback function and the iteration on that. And it's not just you know, um, uh, software, but interestingly, it's, it's hardware too, um, that uh, there is this really kind of amazing ecosystem of original design manufacturers, electronic, manufacturing services where you as a small hardware team can have very large amplification of your ideas because actually you have to do very little of it. There's so much expertise and skill uh, in the supply chain of being able to design, uh, do complete designs against specifications, um, you know, subsystems, whatever you want to full turnkey manufacturing. And that allows people to have the capital efficiency of a software company going and doing hardware, which is actually pretty remarkable. And it's, it's opening up people's imagination to what we're seeing and doing a lot of investing in, people who are reimagining both you know, high performance storage and high capacity storage, and of course the, the software systems that organize those. Um, networking is, is clearly uh, in a very interesting state, uh, whether you're talking about within data center or or wide area, uh, a lot of that has uh, been been reimagined. Um, 
And um, you know, I think there's there's this also interesting seductive thing that you know consumer technology. Uh, which we've seen really enter with flash as main memory uh, in, in uh, seeing the pressures there, but uh, you know, what's happening at PCIe, what's happening potentially with ARM, um, these are all interesting areas uh, to, to, to watch and accessible. So uh, just a, a cartoon way to think about this, this, what's happening on the hardware side of, of acting small but having a big amplifier is you, you just need to sort of have the idea Right, and in a small team, you sort of guide your the the ODMs here to help you build something of which you hope people go discover through the internet. Right, you can go buy AdWords at various places, and uh, you know all different ways of getting out there. Um, and then you rely on this global distribution chain to get your thing out to market. Well, guess what? Um, this is uh, certainly iterative. Uh, that um, you know what you've put into market and the component that you've made is now consumable by somebody else who wants to build the next bigger system using your piece in it, and and sort of it's you know lather, rinse, repeat on this, and and that global supply chain is literally tens and tens of thousands of companies that that go participate in in creating to make you know uh, the the iPhone N plus one. Right? It's, it's really remarkable. So let me just take the last couple of minutes here and talk about you know, from, a, we're, from a venture point of view, when do we get involved and how do we get involved in, in funding? And I, I, you know, there are lots of ways of organizing when you think of idea maturity. Um, uh, you know, these are not bright lines, but if you think of sort of exploratory research, sort of science, advanced development and product development, I categorize those by sort of how, what kind of pleasant surprise do I want, right? So in, in, if, it's, if it's a positive, so, so you know, exploratory research, uh, you're, you're pleasantly surprised, a nice outcome is when somebody shows you something's possible. In advanced development, they, you know, it's kind of practical and in, 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 in a product. It's, it's profitable. And I think that goes on the side of that is sort of your, your views of what's the failure Pareto, right? It, you're, not, you're not taking enough risk, and, and you're not really doing exploratory research, I think, unless you have at least a 50% failure rate, right? Or you should be doing something more exploratory, right? And in advanced development, something less than 50%, depending on where you like to dial these things in. And in product development, we really don't like to see more than like one in five of our companies flame out because they don't know how to build something, right? You, you kind of, you, you sort from there, but um, uh, that's, that's sort of a, a Pareto. So, you know, what we like to do is to take things that are, are you know, to be, been demonstrated as, as practical and scale them up. Right, and turn them into wildly profitable. So that's, that's the uh, sort of the art of then scaling companies uh, after that. I'm going to say just a little bit about that. Seed funding uh, is, is something that um, uh, we're active in. We have 50 seed investments or some north of that now. But it's, it's, um, you know, it's really taking things that are in the exploratory phase and then showing that it's practical and saying, hey, you know what, this could be something we want to put a lot of uh, uh, fuel on the, on the fire for. And I will say, um, and it's a nice dividing line between us and the National Science Foundation, because we don't fund science projects. It's, it's sort of a, it's like a bad word in the venture community, right? Well, that looks like a science project. So if you want to come in and get funding, don't say that, right? So the, you know, the real common characteristics of, of success here are it is small, great, smarting teams. There is, you know, you have to insist on being a few sigma out uh, in the people you choose to be around you. Um, it is this big long-term vision, but it's really tempered by this, you know, I say sharp and pointy, you know, this is what we're going to do in short-term objectives. You're going to throw away, you know, this whole minimal viable product, whatever. We're going to throw away all the, 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 the extraneous stuff. And, and of course, this, this lean, rapid uh, experimentation, and, and you're willing to change and be agile about it. But it's also persistent, right? This takes, this takes time. This is actually like a decade journey to go build a, a large company, and, and most of them are that. Let me just end with sort of, you know, Valley is a great place. There's me with lots of money now, all right? <laughs> great access to capital. You want to go do companies here. There's great community. There's, there's uh, great wine, right? But actually, the most important part about this region the, on the planet, and people want to emulate it, I, is, 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 is this. Now, 
For those who worked at Sun Microsystems, you'll recognize this as a building from the old Menlo Park campus. For those of you who work at Facebook, you'll recognize it as your new campus, right? And um, really, the other thing that you want to look at is the Paul Sappho observation, that with that building there on campus, it's surrounded by soft landscaping. And the reason is, according to Paul, is that if you, when you jump off the roof, the worst thing you do is break an ankle. Thank you.